Welcome back to episode six of Supreme Myths. And although I have loved all of my previous guests, and I hope you listen or watch those, uh, this is the uh, end of the first half of the first season. I hear there are seasons for podcasts. Mine's going to be 12. This is number six. And I'm finishing it with um, a person I have been wanting to interview for 10 years or more, even though he has nothing to do with law. And this podcast will be the first one that has almost nothing to do with law. My guest today is a, um, well, he's a lot of different things. He was a stand-up comedian. He then had an incredibly successful radio show. Some of you may have heard about uh, Stand Up with Pete Dominic on XM Radio on a number of different channels. Uh, He has been a guest on virtually every cable TV news show and has shined every time he has done that. He is one of my closest friends. He now is the host of Stand Up with Pete podcast, which I know many people watching and listening to this will know I've done many times. Pete Dominic, thank you so much for doing this. Professor Eric Siegel, I am very honored to be your guest on this episode, the season finale. I think it's a great choice. It's season finale. Either way, the ratings are going to be a bonanza. And uh, I hope that your normal legal expert listeners, viewers will be able to tolerate me. So I I asked you um, to do this partly because I, since you've known me, you know this. I am very interested in both stand-up comedy and actually radio. And you have excelled at both of those things. Um, So we're going to get into that. But before we do, I have, I got to start with a really serious question that is not related to those topics. Um, but I do need you to answer, and then we'll go on to the lighter topics. Uh, okay. Is, is the Supreme Court a court? I think that, as I think that reasonable people <laughs> disagree, is a phrase that you employ quite often before <laughs> you give a very passionate opinion. Wrong answer. All right. See you next week. We're closing. Close it out, Matt. We're done. Um, Okay. Uh, Pete, I'm going to start with the hardest question I can think of about stand-up comedy, and it's the one that interests me the most, and I am incredibly interested in your opinion on this. So I was listening to one show involving some of the most famous comedians ever, like Seinfeld and, and those guys. I forget the cable show that it was on. And this is what they said. They said if you're on stage and you're doing stand-up, and you say something funny, and people laugh, it can't be wrong. It can't be wrong. There is no limit in terms of bad taste, political correctness. If the audience laughs, it works, and it's funny, and they shouldn't be criticized for it, no matter how offensive it is. Do you agree with that? The question is, can anything be funny, or is that thing funny? The answer is, it is subjective. It is no different at all in any way than looking at fine art and saying, I like Picasso, or I don't like Picasso, or Van Gogh was the greatest painter of all time, or I don't like Van Gogh, or how come there were never female impressionists? I don't think that's valid. (laughs) But I, I, I think that that is a question that is just so subjective. Is it? right is it wrong is it offensive is it not that's up to whoever hears it in a person's life experience it's performing arts it's some people like the ballet some people like broadway some people like feature films i i think that that is the only answer for that question are you freaking running for office you completely ducked my question i'm asking you a very specific thing here Someone goes on stage and uses the N-word or some other incredibly offensive, it characterizes women in some horrific way, whatever it is. But it's, the audience laughs. The audience that's there, and we're not talking about a Ku Klux Klan rally, we're talking about a normal comedy club or, 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 or Netflix, Netflix, you know, doc, uh, stand-up. And you and I would hear that on the street and say, that is offensive, shut the F up. But it works in the context of the joke. These guys, Seinfeld and other people were saying, it doesn't matter how offensive it is. The only question is, did it make the audience laugh? Do you agree with that? I'm not talking the question at all. And no, it's a a more nuanced answer. Let me ask you. Yeah. I'm trying to think of the the three most horrific crimes. 
So rape, murder, and slavery. I mean, child, you can, child, child, you know, any kind of child abuse of any sort, I guess, is a, is a worse kind of, but, but physical abuse. So if there were a painting of a lynching or, you know, the execution of, of a Jewish prisoner of, you know, in, in a concentration camp, if there were a painting of that, is it a good painting? Is it really well done? I wouldn't want to look at that painting. I don't want to watch a rape or see images of that. I would find that grotesque, reprehensible. I wouldn't pay to see it. I wouldn't want to look at it. I'd look away from it. But it's maybe it's a really well done painting. Maybe somebody in somebody else's experience, it's somehow symbolic of, of something. I, I don't know. So when it comes to comedy, I think... Again, reasonable people can agree on obviously what's deeply offensive, uh, you know, the N word or, or 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 certain jokes about rape or other violent crimes and so on. But what is it saying? What is it trying to say? What's it trying to accomplish? And I think most importantly, who is saying it? I think that's really important. So I mean, that that's I think that's a specific answer, and I think that that's a fair answer. Art is subjective. So you're saying your question is about something being funny, if I'm hearing you right. First of all, I, I need to point out two things, and, and you're right. You didn't. You did not duck the question at that point. Um, first, the um, radio host, stand-up comic, podcast host, all-around media guy, just threw out hypotheticals to the law professor. I have worn off on you over ten years. That's the first thing. Second thing, before I get back to the question, where the fuck are my books? I see a bookshelf back there. I don't see my books, and I'm kind of pissed about it. And I, I don't want to see your head either. Oh my God! I well, the last time you were on my show, I think you made a similar comment, and then I found them. Yeah, I forget it too late. All right, go so ahead. I'm, bu I'm building a brand new studio. Six, Your books will be featured up if you don't turn around. Thank you. You're, I'm building a brand new studio, and your books will be featured prominently in that studio, along with a, a few others who you'd recognize. But I'm also thinking I might build the studio out of copies of Supreme Myths, so I'm going to need a few crates of your book to insulate my new studio with. All right. Um, yeah, you made me laugh. All right, going back to my question. I, I'm going to yes. leave it in a minute, but I, I, I want to push back a little bit. So yeah, sure. I assume by the last comment you meant Dave Chappelle – can use the N word in a way that you could not if you were on stage. Is that right? Well, people can use the N word. Women can get away more with, you know, a rape joke, uh, misogyny. Uh, right. it's, it's this question that people, that I think artists, increasingly comedians, debate of punching down. Are you punching down? Are you punching up? Who are you poking fun of? Who are you talking about? And who are you to be able to do it? I'm, I'm filtering that through my head because um, I was surprised when I heard these. And maybe this is the answer. I don't remember the group of comedians, but they were the four or five of the most famous in the world. And they all agreed on this point that there is no question other than was it funny. And I was and I, I guess I feel like maybe is, is maybe the answer. If it's funny, it's probably not in bad taste. First of all, you may be talking about Ricky Gervais. And Louis C.K. and Jerry yeah. Seinfeld and Chris Rock. Is that? I think that was it. Yeah, I think very so. Very famous, a very famous gathering of, of four of the titans of comedy, one of which is, you know, admitted to his own horrible crimes, sexual uh, uh, assault. That's off the stage. That's different. Yeah. It's off the stage, but it just, it, it still, it, it makes the person's judgment about such things questionable. And also, those are the kind of comments that were made for that conversation. And also, uh, you know, you're asking the question a little bit differently. So okay, okay. if the question is, is it funny, There, it, that depends. It's the eye of the beholder. Is it right? It's a different question. Is it going to work for a, a large group of people? Maybe, maybe not. Depends on the group of people, when and where. Okay. okay. Um, fair enough. Uh, so, Pete, were you funny when you were 10? If I go up in front of a black audience, an all black audience, I I can kill. I can make all of them laugh. That's very hard. And I don't do it by punching down at them. I talk about my experience with and in black culture and it works great. So there are ways to make people laugh about race and gender and sexuality 
that aren't punching down, it's harder to do. Well, you, you um, well, I, I'd ask you a question in between that, but I want to go back to this. Can you, and this puts you on the spot, I'm sorry, but you've put me on the spot a few times in our respective lives. Well, Can you tell a joke that you think would be funny to an all black audience that you might not tell to a white audience? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I won't do the whole jokes, but talking about my experiences in black churches for a funeral and a wedding and not having any idea of the culture, the customs, the, the songs, all of it, and having everybody kind of stare at me <laughs> and, and watch me and laugh at me. Those are the jokes. I won't do all those jokes right now on your show, but those are the types of uh, uh, ideas and premises that they love because it's truth and they know it, and they've been there, and I've been there, but those are jokes I can make because I spent a lot of time with black folks in different settings. So once you understand, you know, whether it be, or maybe you spent a lot of time with, maybe you married a Chinese American, and so you have jokes about what it's like being immersed in Chinese American culture. So it, you have to have those experiences to tell the jokes about them. Was I funny when I was 10? Yes. <laughs> Did people think you were funny when you were 10? Yes. Can you give it the only, way, the only reason I know I was funny, it's not about modesty. It's about people laughed when I did and said things. So, like what? Yeah. Like what? Impressions, uh, slapstick, uh, characters. At that age, I was doing that type of stuff. Uh, my dad told bits. I didn't know they were bits then, but my dad would perfect a bit, a story. He went into the store and this happened and he would do the voices of the characters and I would watch him do that and I would watch him get laughed. He could hold a whole group of people hanging on his every word, his inflections, his his embodiment of the other people and his passion with which he told it. And I watched everybody laugh and then I did it. And my my brother, you know, took it to another level and made me understand, you know, what comedy was. And and of course, you always have a, a, a humor that you share with your sibling. And so I developed uh, my humor with him. And then I realized that this was something that was getting me attention and making me feel good. And I didn't feel like people were laughing, you know, at me. I felt like I was making them laugh. And I, that's, as, 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 I, I did that as long as I could remember. I liked the attention of other people. I didn't, it didn't make me uncomfortable. It made me feel more comfortable. Do you remember, Do you, was there a moment in time where you decided I'm going to try to make a living out of this? Or was it kind of a gradual, you know, uh, thing? Yeah, my father told me and my brother to find jobs that we enjoyed doing at some point, maybe in my early teens, he would say that kind of a thing. And that was the only thing he wanted for us to enjoy our jobs, because I think, well, my dad did OK and he didn't go to college and he owned an insurance agency and he, he, he was smart with his money, but he didn't love that job. I don't think selling insurance and everything that went along with it, you know, I think aspects of it, but he wanted us to enjoy our job. So I enjoyed making people laugh. And I realized, you know, at that time, Saturday Night Live was the only thing I watched that was kind of, you know, comedy. I didn't watch the, the late night shows or anything. I watched Saturday Night Live. I realized those guys were making money and good money and they were respected and and they made me laugh. And they I thought, wow, that's something that you can do. I was good at impressions. So I decided I wanted to be a comedian in ninth grade. Wow. wow. So. Um, my first experience with Saturday Night Live was on my fraternity house's floor in 1976. Were you born in 1976? I was born in October 31st, 1975. You're killing me. Okay. Um, and I thought the first two seasons of Saturday Night Live, and I still think, I think, is the funniest TV I've ever seen. Have you gone back? Yeah, I, don't, you, I don't agree with that, but. Okay. Uh, but, and that's you, you answer to your it? earlier you, question, you by the way. You were two. How would you know? You were two. I, I mean, there's the internet. I mean, the, 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 <laughs> what's that? Rerun. What's I mean, that? Do you not realize how technology works? <laughs> you didn't have to be there for it. I've also seen the talkies and Charlie <laughs> Chaplin, and I've seen paintings of biblical times. <laughs> you, I want to go back to something you said, because uh, you have two daughters. I have three. We have five daughters between us, and they're... <laughs> 
and they've been together and it's been lovely when they've been together. Um, so your father, the older daughter, but yeah, I'm, I'm guessing, um, your father and my father were fairly different yes. people. Uh, my father was a very successful uh, businessman, not that yours wasn't, but he worked 70 hours a week, traveled all the time. I didn't see him growing up, um, and, uh, ended up in some, you know, it was just quintessential business. But when I was 13 and I was forced to be bar mitzvahed <laughs> against my will, um, about the next day, and I left the Jewish church temple forever. The next day, or within the week after that, my dad came to me and said, when you grow up, I want you to have a job that you love. I don't care if you make money. I don't care if you can live in a big house. I don't care what else happens in your life professionally, as long as you have a job you love, and I will do everything I can to help you get a job you love. And I think it's interesting both our fathers said that because I think a lot of parents don't say that, and it's a shame. Why do you think your dad said that, given his work? Why would he say that to his son? Because yeah, I've never worked half the amount of hours in a week. He worked every week. Um, he thought he was working too hard, and he didn't want you to work like that? You know, my dad's alive. He's 91. Um, and uh, I should ask him the question you just asked me because I never asked that question. My, my guess is— Let's call he him right now. <laughs> I wish we could because he's bored out of his mind in his retirement home. You know, COVID. we can feed um, him into the podcast. Let's get it going. We should do Matt, one with the. I want to interview your. I want to interview your dad. <laughs> he might like. I that. interview interesting people for a living. Your dad's a fascinating guy. Yeah, my dad was a Marxist in college, and then became Ooh. like you know. Yeah, really, uh, in McGill University, and then he became this really successful businessman. It's kind of interesting, but he never he never got conservative. He he wasn't a Marxist when he was running the credit card division at American Express, but he was always liberal. I mean, he was always liberal, which is interesting to me because he was not. But anyway, what I want to say was I think he said that to me because he implicitly, at some level, he knew he was making sacrifices. Like he knew, he knew that he was sacrificing family time for work time. And unlike my brother, who is also a very successful businessman and works 70 hours a week, I think my dad intuitively knew I was never going to do that. Like I, That was never going to be my path. And I think he wanted to tell me that I was okay. I think yeah, that's what... time, time, humans and Americans, I think, this is my thought, have been fed the deep, pernicious untruth, which is that money – is the primary and most important form of currency. I think that is just so preposterous. I think time, time is the only currency. And the time that you get to do the things you like, to be with the people that you like, the time that you get where you're at your healthiest, that is the only thing that we should measure our, our wealth by. And as, as a parent, you know, we talk, you and I talk parenting a lot, You've taught me a lot. You've given me great advice, and and you've always, you know, you've always always said there's no right answer. But this is, I think, what I would do or what I have done. And I and I think there is no so there is no right parenting advice except for maybe maybe this, which is try to spend as much time as you can with your kids. Don't get caught up on work and career if there's any way possible. Easy to say, harder to do because the, you could be a very poor in in financial wealth person. But your kid wants to be with you and around you, most likely, even if you don't know what you're doing as a parent. So I, I, I think that that is the, the most important thing that I have learned in my life as a family man. Not that that was anything remotely near what you asked. But to me, I try to work that into every possible conversation I can have. And I would love to be wrong about that. Or I wouldn't love to be wrong about that, but I'd be, I'm open to being you know, expanding that idea. I, I think you're hundred percent right about that. And by time, I don't mean sitting in, you don't mean, I don't mean sitting in the same room while they're on their phone and you're doing work. Um, Pete, the, uh, some people, remember. some people will be listening to this and some people will be watching this for the people who are watching this. I have no choice. I don't have a choice in this. I don't have discretion. I must have you stand up. Now, Why? I will explain after you do so. I want people. I want people to see the respect. No, back up. Uh, yeah, there we go. I want people to see the respect with which you came to this to this podcast. Are I'm you wearing, wearing pajamas? I'm wearing swimming. I'm wearing my swimming trunks. You're wearing your swimming trunks. Are you this aware the, they were visible two minutes ago? Th this is another kind of a 
like a weird fancy of the past. And by past, I mean the before times. By before times, I mean when we left our homes. And that is that I'm going to dress a certain way. I mean, like, I don't want to be a slob. I did. I put on a shirt. Thank you. A t-shirt that didn't have writing on it. That's as far as I would go for almost anybody. <laughs> All right. Um, I just, I think you're Which, you're by fan. the way, getting back to comedy is a, yeah. is a site. It could be a site gag if we want to, you know, the idea that I'm going to send a message uh, uh, with my clothing, with my my wardrobe. I mean, you're all, you always are, even if you don't mean to, which is why some comedians like a Louis C.K., honestly, some of the greats, they dress as blandly as possible to make sure they draw all their attention to their face and their jokes. And nothing about the outfit should say anything about who you are. And there's this kind of, and I think that's a lot of artists, but especially with comedians, I don't need any kind of cool outfit or look good. I'm wearing all black, like a goddamn stagehand, and I'm going to be a genius. <laughs> um, that was my attempt at a sight gag, was having you show your... Um your your bathing suit, which shows I should stick to law and probably get away from this whole genre. Um, it's okay. It's fine. I think it's what good. is I think the it worst experience you've ever had on stage as a stand-up? I think probably I was in a, a Connecticut hunting bar. And what's a hunting we were, bar? Wait, oh, well, what's a hunting bar? Like a bar kind of out in, in, in a rural area where guys come after they're done hunting. <laughs> that's uh, that's or, just funny. You people, can stop there. Or, no, the joke is done. You can stop. You, you can just stop right there. That's the, the idea of you, bleeding heart liberal Pete Dominic, in a hunting bar is kind of funny. But go ahead. Well, no, it's it's actually if you if you knew me better than than as good as you should, you should know that that's where I grew up. I grew up literally my yard. The hunters walked through my yard okay. to go kill deer. We gave them permission hey, on, on, on on you know on trout season and deer season. Mo half my my class wasn't there. I can code switch with a hunting bar. Hold on but, a minute. Oh, you grew up in Syracuse, New York. No, I didn't. My first seven years of life, I was living kind of in a, in a more urban uh, setting. And then at age eight, we moved to a rural development. I thought you... Okay, let's just be clear about one thing before you finish your hunting bar story. There is no part of New York State. I understand Jack Kemp country. I understand Buffalo. I've been there many times. I understand upstate New York, western New York. We, there is no part of New York State that is rural compared to South Georgia or Alabama. I just want to put that on the record. Go ahead. Tell your story. Well, if, if you're only measuring by the distance to a, a, an area, a population area, no, I suppose. That's but, not what I was saying. Yeah, go on. I don't the, Adirond the Adirondack Mountains are, pr are pretty rural. And, I went and, to camp and, there, buddy. I, 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 listen, <laughs> I don't know what kind of a binary about how rural <laughs> your state is versus mine you want to create, but you win. <laughs> You can have it with your Georgia, your Georgia clan. I mean, so that's why I, you know, that, that, I, I recently heard a black person. I used to do it. Speaking of black uh, jokes about black folks and black culture, <laughs> uh, racism is about irrational fears. And I would, you know, I asked my uh, college roommate, who was a black guy who lived in Brooklyn, to go to my parents' house for the weekend. He said, what are we going to do up there? I said, well, I don't know. We'll go for a hike in the woods. And he was like, hell no. <laughs> Black people, I heard someone say recently, why we were talking about nature and connection to nature, environmentalism, and 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 the and there being a problem with black folks not being as connected to natural areas as, as others, as white people. And the, some black guy goes, that's because there was a time when we went into the woods, we didn't come out. And that's what I think of when I think of like Georgia rural areas. I think of like, oh my God, it must be scary to be out there. For, well, just, for just black folks, even though a lot of them are farmers. Okay, one minute of serious, then back to your bar. You know, it wasn't, it was this year that an African American jogger was jogging in rural Georgia and got murdered by an ex police officer. Allegedly murdered, excuse me. Allegedly murdered by an ex police officer. All right, so you walk into this bar. Go ahead. And. It's like a hunting bar, and it's also like a sport. Like, they're there watching sports. There's a lot of TV screens on. I was opening for that Lisa Lampelli, who's now a very successful, famous comedian. And I went up first. I was the first act. There's no stage, Eric. <laughs> I was just standing there, and the guy <laughs> was standing right in front of me. I was more like I was talking to him. And so the TVs were on. You can't. 
you can't do stand-up comedy when there's another <laughs> form of entertainment around. It's not like, and uh, we, I, re I just remember when we wrapped that show up that we ran to the car because we thought we they were mad at us. That's one. I've got, I could fill a book uh, with others. Listeners from my Sirius XM show booked me to, and flew me out to Detroit, put me up in the, that real nice hotel in the airport. But I performed at like, I'll call this a union bar where all the guys that worked in the assembly line at Ford would go. And they, there was, I did my first set for nine guys sitting in a bar. I stood on a milk crate. They flew me all the way out there to be at this <laughs> dive bar. They just wanted to meet me. There was no, uh, there was no show. And then he booked me to do two shows. He's like, we have another one. I'm like, another one? The, the, the first one wasn't a show. It was Some woman says, come out in, in my car and smoke a joint with me before the next show. I say, okay. I go out. We're sitting in a car. A ton of uh, uh, ambulances and police cars show up to the bar I had just left. Okay? We're like, what's going on in the bar between shows? Eric, there was a stabbing between shows at the bar I was at. Luckily, I was in some lady's car smoking a, a little whiskey. Are you sure that wasn't a hallucination? I'll never forget that. I remember feeling guilty being in a car with a woman. I remember that. I was like, <laughs> maybe this woman like is going to make a pass at me because I'm married and I'm happily married and I don't want to be in that situation. But I don't. But no, I think she just wants to smoke weed. And luckily, that's all it was. And but while we're sitting there smoking, a whole bunch of police show up. We go in. There's blood on the floor. I'm like, do I still have to do the second show? He's like, can I pay you like uh, just for the first show and I'll bring you back to the airport? I'm like, yes. <laughs> so I want to, I want to, that was funny. I want to, I want to tell a story about you. So I'm going to talk for a few minutes now. Um, so Pete uh, is, is very green. I'm not, but he is. We've had these debates. Um, and Pete was doing a week long. By thing green, you mean I'm environmentally conscious and it's a weird thing. So say it again and, and replace green with environmentally conscious. Start over. Are you, inv are you interrupting the host? See, when I used to do that, you'd have a mute button. I don't have a mute say button. Say it though. over. <laughs> I will not. Um, Pete is extraordinarily green. I'm extraordinarily not. I'm green because my wife is green. I'm, I'm, that's all. That's the only reason. Um, so... Pete has, is doing a, a week-long, or I don't know how long it was, thing in, in Georgia, actually. Actually, kind of in rural Georgia, um, but at this very, very liberal place that we have down here. It's a resort about an hour from Atlanta. And uh, this whole week, Pete is doing green stuff, which is really good for him. And it's good role modeling for his girls. Anyway, it's all culminating in a comedy show at the end of the week. And so Pete, <laughs> Pete, Pete invites... For those listening, not watching, Pete is doing weird things with books and pencils and stuff. Um, so uh, Pete and I had been, been friends a long time, and, and, and we were cutting up the whole day. Our families were together the whole day. We were in a pool together, um, everything. Um, and, 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 and Pete's a certain kind of way. And then we meet him before the show, about 45 minutes or an hour before the show, maybe two hours. And the head of the, the, the stage department at this resort is talking to Pete about the show that night and all of a sudden everything about Pete changes and what was a completely frivolous funny joking day turned into something very different than that. and you were not happy with the setup and you weren't happy with the setup in a couple different ways one of which was I remember the back was outside the background was a beautiful lake and you said fuck that you can't have a background of a lake behind me because people, especially at sunset, which when it was, will be looking at the beautiful scenery and not at me. And we have to fix this. And you effectively said, I'm not going on if you don't fix this. And you turned really professional. And I was really impressed. And, and they did fix it. And that was the first time I kind of saw you treat stand up as the business that it is almost people think it's an art it's also a business right yeah the the, the actually the the more interesting i hope i didn't quite talk that way to a person there and i was probably talking that way to you but not to them i wasn't like fuck this to the people organizing it right i'm gonna roll the videotape in about two minutes so well I, a better example and and people you're you're talking about something that you know doesn't exist on 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 tape that performance or 
or yeah. maybe it does. I don't know. But but th th that that conversation, something that kind of does is my appearance on Donald Trump's The Apprentice. In which case, uh, I guess this part doesn't appear on tape. But what happened was we were there, and and the organizers, the producers, were telling us how it was going to be. To me and the other comedians who were performing on the show, and and I stopped them and told them, "No, you don't know what you're doing. Let." Us produce this. We're comedians. We've got thousands of shows under our belt. And I, I took over and produced it for the, the apprentice contestants who the objective of that episode was to do a fundraiser. And they were using a stand up comedy show to raise the money to attract the people out. So they had no idea. So you have to when when you're performing, sometimes it might look like you're being difficult or seem that way to, to people. But if you know what you're doing, you, you do the best you can to create the best possible environment for the performer to succeed and stand up is a pretty basic formula how to create optimal success and you know it's pretty straightforward in terms of the lighting and the sound and the stage i, I guess i think so, i think some people probably like me before i met you thought you know your stand up you obviously we i knew you worked very hard on your material and try it out and all that stuff um but it's actually much more than that. There's a lot of different things that go into it that I didn't think about. Pete, I want to um, embarrass you, so you're about to be embarrassed. Um, uh, do, you, do you really think you're going to embarrass me? I mean, no. is that possible at this point? I don't think so. Probably not. Um, but but I'm going to try. Um, oh. I do want you to tell the story about that TV show that you actually quit, which really could have made your career better than it's been. You, that, that could have elevated your career. <laughs> The, the the last comedian standing or whatever that show was. Oh, yeah, last comic standing. I don't know if I've ever heard you tell this story like on air or anything, and it's a great story. Well, they 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 chose me. I auditioned, and they chose me to be Start one. Of what, what, what was the show? Last Comic Standing was a show on NBC. It was a like a reality show competition where they had comedians like basically live in a house together for however long period of time. And at the end of the week or however often they did it, they would do a performance. And the uh, and there were judges that would decide uh, who would go on to the next week, and it would whittle down, you know, as these reality yeah, shows yeah. do, to a you know a couple contestants, and eventually they would name a winner, and that person would. Uh, have a real boost in their career in the kind of way that, you know, The Tonight Show used to do for someone like Gary Shandling. But that was a, a great thing to be a part of in some ways. And in other ways, it was a risk. But even if you won, you know, it was a, it was a temporary boost. Basically, what happened was it was it was looked down upon by comedians in the comedy community be, because it was a competition and we don't like competitions between comedians very much but it was kind of a necessary evil to succeed and very few people said no to the opportunity to be on that show and i didn't either so i auditioned for it i knew a lot of the people involved with it comedy is a small community i got chosen by the judges to be one of the finalists in the in the new york auditions which would mean you'd go to la and you or las vegas or something and the producers basically they they got back to me and said that they that I would need to take like a leave from the show I was hosting at the time on Sirius XM because it would be unfair because I'd be on the show every day and I could be asking for votes because I guess viewers would also vote and that would be unfair, which is interesting to think about at this point in time. But they said you didn't need to take a leave. And I didn't that that job was an awesome job at Sirius XM. And I knew it was going to lead to other things. I hoped it would. And I didn't have a contract. And I thought, well, if I leave, I might not be able to come back. And this job is in the long run going to help me a lot more than that show would in the short run. And more importantly than any of that was I realized that they edited you because it was a reality show and they could edit you to be whoever and they wanted whatever and they did that they curated your character and i had built a reputation at that point for 10 years and i was proud of my reputation whatever that reputation was i didn't want nbc to edit me into being somebody who i wasn't and so for those reasons i said no i'm not going to leave my this gig to, to do that. And I don't want you to edit me anyway. I want to be able to kind of as much as I can control my reputation in this in this business. 
And so I chose to to not do it, and they didn't have me. I think I I, I think that's again just to get serious for thirty seconds. Uh, one of the things I've learned to love about you over the last decade is you are yourself, and um, and I don't think I don't think any career opportunity would alter that. Probably um, is my guess, and I don't think I think I mean we know a lot of people aren't like that because these reality shows are full of people. Who are willing to sacrifice everything about themselves to get on TV, um, and they're not even in, and they're not even in the, in the business. Um, and I, and I, I think that's a good story, Pete. I think it says something about you. Yeah, I guess, I guess so. I mean, I mean, I'm, in in the end, I'm certainly happy because th- that one hour a day show I was hosting turned into a three hour a day full time job that you know provided a, a, a lifestyle for my family for twelve and fourteen years. My daughters, you know, and and um, it was awesome. So. Great. I'm really familiar with that show. It was great. Um, uh, Pete, a couple of lightning round type questions. Um, okay. There's, you have one comedian you can only see for the rest of your life. You're only allowed to listen or view or watch one comedian for the rest of your life. Who is it? Dave Chappelle. You, you told me that about 10 years ago, I think, or eight years ago, before I'd actually watched him. So Lynn and I have been watching a lot of his stuff, his old <laughs> stuff, his new stuff. What do you – so I think he's really funny and important. I'm as usual I have a take that is unorthodox I think he's great I don't think he's as funny as Richard Pryor or Robin Williams or um, and even maybe some lesser known comedians what do you like about him so much I like his delivery a lot I like the kind of his persona his kind of laid back I like the way his voice sounds the sound of his voice I like all of his material I mean some of his layer stuff Recent stuff is, 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 I think, offensive when it comes to, like, gender and trans stuff and, and some of the other things, I think, as well. But um, Did your phone just I, ring? Wait a minute. Did your phone just ring on my show? I'm so sorry. I didn't know that it was even possible. It was what my wife. What would have happened had that happened to me on your show? I would harass you. <laughs> In what way? Because I want to learn. I would criticize you and say, how dare you not take this show so seriously that you would turn off your phone? No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't do any of that shit. What you would do is make fun of my lack of technical skill, technology skill. Oh, right. Well, of course, that would be that, too. (laughs) Well, that's accurate. Uh, I don't know how you're pulling this off. Luckily, you've got another, you know, this great guy, uh, Matt, helping you out here producing. But uh, so back to Chappelle. So I think um, the voice, the delivery, the material, and he makes me think about a lot of stuff, but like Carlin and Pryor, he does characters, he does voices, he does fart jokes, he does sex jokes, but he also does really important social commentary, and I, I learn stuff. So for all those reasons, you know, and 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 the, I could give you similar reasons why I might not like another comedian. I don't like his voice. I don't like the delivery. I don't like some of the material. There's not enough of a range. I don't relate to what he or she is saying. People, I get that. I get that. I, I think he's great. Don't get me wrong. We're in the Hall of Fame of comedians here. That's all I'm, you know. Um, yeah. yeah. But p- people my age, which is much older than your age, unfortunately, uh, um, I think I can generalize about this. I think people who enjoyed <laughs> watching comedy in the 70s, mid, early 70s, mid 70s, late 70s, throughout mm-hmm. the 80s and 90s, Richard Pryor's first movie, I think is and a special or uh, feature film? Yeah, what do you his, stand, his first thing, no, yeah, not his acting job. He was a terrible, he, he did terrible movies as an actor. First movie stand up special. His first stand up, where um, I, I think is the funniest 90 minutes I've ever seen. Uh, other than a live from the sunset strip, no, before that, that's that's his third. <laughs> I know more about this than you do. Um, that's his I story. don't remember stuff like this about anything, like whether yeah. it be comedy or music albums and things like that. I, I, I generally don't. As your friend, I would like you at some point to go back and watch his first one. Because I can't Live imagine. And smoking. I don't remember what it was called. The second one, he talked about lighting himself on fire. That's the second one. The first one is so, you know, he, he did the first one, then he lit himself on fire. That was terrible. He talked about yeah, that. Lot, yeah, and it was called. Uh, he was free basic. Live and smoking because he was because he set himself on fire. But yeah, anyway, yeah. I, I don't remember what. Yeah, but that was yeah. I yeah, mean, the listen, first, the, but the Richard first fire is amazing. What what are we saying? Well, are I'm we comparing that, them? I, I'm just saying the first one of those. I think everybody should watch. All right, another question. <laughs> um, dealing with hecklers, is that something that can be taught, or is that something you just naturally can do? Uh, it's something 
you know, it's hard to teach comedy. You you have to keep doing it over and over and over. And hecklers or audience member behavior, because when you think of heckler, you just think of somebody being like, "You're not funny." But it's yeah, it's, yeah. it's so much more than that. It's it's more. It's usually not that kind of overt or rude. It's it's usually people wanting to be a part of the show that you're really. You know, you, you don't want them to be a part of your show uh, or or you do. I like the audience being a part of the show, so I, I incorporate them uh, entirely. But it is really something that is you have to learn because it's not like defending being heckled on the street, being made fun of, you know, at school or something like that. It, there, there are a lot of yeah, different yeah. dynamics. You don't want to lose the whole audience by being mean back. Do you have a go-to? Do you, so, so assume someone's in the audience, um, and and is getting in the way of the timing of your jokes, right? Now, and I assume I don't know this. I'm assuming timing is incredibly important to be funny, um, and they're really making it hard. Do you have a go-to way of dealing with that? Well, you can always go to that audience member. You know, what do you do for a living? And then when they tell you what their job is, you you say, well, I don't come to that job, and. <laughs> And, and and do what you're doing to me. This is my job. So, you know, and, and that's a that's a really it's still, though, kind of a framed and scripted thing. And the, the better way to do it is to really be in the moment and original and handle that specific person with the delicacy that that they need to get what you want. Keep the show going and also get them to behave the way you want them to, which is either to sh- be quiet or or be a part of the show in a, in a, in a less interrupted way. So you don't want to scold people because that takes the, the magic out of the, the humor of the moment. You don't want the audience to feel uncomfortable in that way. So you, you have to try to keep it going. And that's a very, very delicate balance to handle somebody in the audience and not lash out and be angry and let, by the way, this happens a lot with, with comedians who are frustrated with their career, especially you take out on that one person everything bad that's happened in your career with audiences and live performances. I've seen that hundreds of times. It's very sad to watch, and it's no fun. And you can only imagine an audience member going, I paid for this horror? Right. Um, I have a hard question about I think. Maybe it's an easy question, but I think this is a hard question about this. <laughs> but I'm really curious because it goes to a lot of other issues we talk about all the time. An interrupter who you want to stop interrupting, not someone who's been kind of clever, someone who you just want to shut up for the rest of the show. Can you handle men and women the same way? Do you do yes. treat exactly the same, no, no gender difference, no. exactly the same? You have to, I think, with men, there's, there are no, I think, rules at all. But with women, as long as you handle them without doing something that is overtly gender-based, like calling them a gender-based name, uh, which right, I do right. see a lot, a B or a C. I do see comedians do that a lot. I've seen that hundreds of times, but I would, you know, if anything, if you're walking a fine line, you might make fun of the, the, the tone of their voice or something like that. Like, like, ma'am, miss, every time I and the audience hears you speaking, our immediate reaction is, I did not come here to hear this lady talk. <laughs> I didn't, I have no interest in what she has to say. And if I'm being honest, your voice sounds like someone is punching me in my ears. So, you know, things like very specific to them, what they're wearing or something like that. But you don't you don't want to make it about and if you do make it about their gender or their ethnicity, you, you got to be careful that you're not like putting them down in a way as well like so so it's it's you have to the only way to handle it is with a tremendous amount of experience frankly being in those situations over and over and over it's like anything else in life you have to have that experience to know how to deal with it and you can't have that experience without really years of being in that situation it's not like moments similar off stage it's a completely different thing you're doing a show all right one last question about comedy um so in this horrific COVID time, we're all at home zooming and doing other things. Uh, it, I feel like Netflix has an unlimited array of comedians doing stand up um, from the most famous, from Seinfeld and Ellen, you know, all the way down to people I've never <laughs> heard of. Um, and there, I think there's like, I don't know, 50 of them or more. I mean, they're, they're, I, can, I can watch stand up for the rest of my life on Netflix. Um, and they seem very well, very well edited and very well lighted and very, very professional and all that stuff. 
Is that going to change the business? You think the the ubiquity of stand up specials available on Netflix? Yeah. No, I think uh, the, the I think the take that I hear the most is that the more specials, the more likely you are to go see live stand up. Oh, that's mm-hmm. interesting. I haven't thought about that. When it, 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 and it, the, the specials introduce people to the performance uh, form of performance. People might call it an art form. Uh, and, you know, stand up. Most Americans have not been to a stand up comedy club or, or theater and seen stand up. So you see someone on Netflix. And at some point, whether you are a freshman in college and they brought a comedian to your campus, which I've done like 400 of those. Or, yeah. you know, you're you're living in Madison, Wisconsin, and they have a comedy club or Chicago or somewhere where, you know, obviously New York and other places. Um, you might go out to that comedy club, but mainly because you saw that special on on TV and you're most likely going to be disappointed because the comedian you see at the club is going to be as good as the one you saw in that manicured performance on television. But I think it's mostly a good thing. And, you know, the same question was asked back in the 80s. And I think it was different then. I think it actually did hurt live comedy. But now I think, it, like, according to most comedy club owners before the pandemic, they were doing pretty well. People were enjoying, like, a lot of people would come out and see live comedy in all kinds of different venues, meaning there was a, a, a large demand for it, regardless of how much there was available on Netflix, Comedy Central, HBO, et cetera. So I lied. So I, had one, I lied. I had one more question. That I thought of while you were I talking. Think, why? I didn't just think you just thought of another question. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I don't think Snopes would qualify that as a pants on fire. Is it Snopes who does pants on fire? I, I, Politifact. <laughs> Politifact is watching this, and I'm in trouble already. But of course, if Politifact was watching me, I'd be in trouble for other things. Um, I was watching Seinfeld's last, most recent stand up. Which Did I thought he talk was. talk about how he like dated a 16 year old when he was 35? Because that's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> And Nobody's <laughs> talking about that. Like Seinfeld definitely has gotten a pass on dating uh, whatever her name was, Shoshana. I feel like she I was under age. I think she was 17. I think she may have been 17. I'm not sure. Yeah, it was, yeah. yeah I, I'm not uh, whatever, whatever yeah. going on. You're watching Seinfeld. I'm watching Seinfeld, and I, and I was a fan of his show like everybody else, you know, in the, in the 90s. Um, but and I, and I like his early stand-up. And I'm watching this, and it was only funny occasionally. Like it was by no means genius or brilliant or anything like that. I think his early stand-up is genius and brilliant. And it made me think about this. Um, So I've been teaching law for 29 years, 29, I'm entering my 30th. And I know I've lost, I know I've lost some stuff. Like I'm, I I can't go around the room as quickly as I could 20 years ago. I don't think I'm quite as in the moment as I used to be. Age has caught up with me. I'm doing my best. I think I'm okay. I think I'm okay, but I am past my prime. but I'm not, my main job is to convey information, not make people laugh. So, you know, I convey the information. I think like great athletes, do great comedians not know when to stop? Because I think he should stop. And he, God knows he has enough no. money to stop. No. Seinfeld should stop? No. No. But he wasn't good. He wasn't that funny. That's not true. That okay. I, Earlier I said it's subjective. I Seinfeld's pretty much always funny. Um, he might not be as funny as some of the stuff that you used to like, but that's that's part and parcel to kind of your preferences as comedians and artists evolve, you know, look at your favorite. You can talk about music. I can't, but I mean, I could talk about you two only. And I mean, the way that they experimented with their different albums, people like, well, I like Joshua tree a lot better than what they did with Zuropa. And then they got back to the root. Like, you know, you change, you experiment. And and the same thing with you as a, as a scholar and a teacher, you, you, you change the ways I'm sure you've fiddled with how you communicate. Now you're doing it on zoom. That's a new way to communicate. And so I, I mean, did, did Don Rickles ever stop being funny? No, he probably slammed the coroner. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I love Don Rickles, by the way. I love. Yeah, him. so and I think of Don Rickles because I think he was very old and very funny all the way to the end. Uh, people talk about George Carlin's later stuff was angry and not funny. Dave Chappelle's recent eight minute special or whatever it was. That wasn't eight minutes. It was about the eight minutes and 46 seconds of George Floyd. Like, I didn't think it was funny. And what, like it, it, we all try new things and change and adapt. So you could put out a a, a crappy album. I don't think it's any different than music in that one comparison alone. You could put out an album that you tried to do this. You know, there's a comedian named Burt Kreischer. He performs with his shirt off. Like maybe he'll throw his shirt back on at some point. Like, you know, people, (laughs) uh, bizarre, but. I get what you're saying. And Lenny Bruce is the best (laughs) example, right? I mean, Lenny Bruce. I don't think, I don't think that you, the comedy, 
as you get older, you you might find a new audience. The 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 the, the people that grow up with you stay with you. I think that's true of a lot of media as well. The, the you know the older you get, like you talk about your kids when they're young on stand up. Then you talk about your kids going to college and your stand up. Then you talk about your divorce or whatever you're going through. And as long as people relate to it, I mean, if you can't get an erection, you can't pee. Uh, those are real. I'm sorry, things. Pete. That's happening to you. I'm sorry. That's happening to you. Well, when it does, <laughs> I will talk about it. Unlike you, who's ter terrified of admitting such things. I am not terrified. Well, I am. That's true. Um, fair enough. Um, all right. Um, so that's the end of that segment. We're about done. I'm out of time. But I do have one thing. Ser well, I have a serious thing and then a closing. Um, okay. Is Trump going to win? I don't. I mean, I, if there's a free and fair election, uh, this, he doesn't have a chance, I don't think. I don't think there, he has the voters. The, the number of things that can and probably will go wrong with, you know, mail-in ballots and what they'll try to do to them and disqualify them or that they, you know, people won't just won't understand how to open an envelope or the hijinks that could be uh, made on purpose or just just because they weren't budgeted for the whether or not the Postal Service can deliver. And obviously the most obvious one. Two obvious ones, the pandemic, which could scare people. I mean, I've been saying I would crawl through a river of COVID to vote on a voting machine made of COVID uh, because I want to vote so badly. <laughs> and I think a lot of people will wait in long lines. And, you know, there's going to be all kinds of hijinks. If it were a free and, and, and fair election, no. But if there's the pandemic is raging and there are issues with getting people out, then it'll be different. And uh, the final point would be, you know, foreign interference. And I think that the Russians aren't going to try as hard when they see the writing on the wall that he doesn't have a chance. And I think Chinese don't really want to do it. And the Iranians don't really want to do it. And so changing actual ballots is going to be hard if they're paper ballots. So that's my my nuanced answer. The reason I asked it, I wanted to, I, 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 that's a great answer. And, and the reason I asked it was because there may, I only asked that question for one reason. He doesn't have uh, the votes. Yeah. I agree. He had the votes. I don't think he had the votes last time, to be honest. He didn't um, have the votes last time. He had a lot of the votes were suppressed. Uh, yeah. She won by three million votes. You know. Yeah. And in the various states that mattered in total, it was like 75,000. Anyway, I asked that question, Pete, for a person, uh, for a reason. Um, there may be people listening to this or watching this who know me but don't know you. I doubt it, but there may be. And for those people, I want Not them after to... after I tweet it out. <laughs> for, the, for that reason, I wanted people to understand, because we didn't talk about it today. Uh, after your stand-up career, or you still did it, but, but your main job for most of the last 15 years or whatever has been a uh, talk show host talking about every issue that's important that we deal with as a country. Um, and you've done it, in my opinion, as well as anybody's <laughs> ever done it, and I want you to do it again. And... Um, I want I wanted people to see that hear that side of you, because your answer was really thoughtful. Which which don't say anything. It just was. Um, anything you say will ruin it. So it was a it was a great answer. It's the right answer, I think. Um, and um, I wanted people to hear that side of you. And then well, I wanted my, to say, but, but I do have to say something because my show has never been about my answers to things. It's been about my questions to people like you. Fair enough. That is true. Um, and that's that's why I loved your show and. You're also really thoughtful in these things. And you couldn't possibly ask good questions if you weren't really thoughtful. And you are. Um, so I just want to end this by saying I wouldn't – there is oh, – go ahead. You have one more thing to say. Go ahead. I was only going to say you. The, much of what we talked about today, you asked me questions about literally the only thing I'm an expert about talking about, which is comedy. I mean so that it's the only issue where I feel most comfortable – in my answers, all of the other answers I gave you to things, there's always this inner monologue going, what would someone more credible than me say? I, I don't think there's anyone in the country who could have given a better answer to the Trump question than you gave. So I, that's for the record, I will say that. What um, I wouldn't be doing Call the gala. I would. <laughs> that was good. I like that. Can you imitate? Uh, wait, before we go, are there other talking heads you can imitate? Because I like that one. Can you imitate? I don't know. I, that wasn't an Im impression of Paul Begala. That was just me doing, you know. No, you sounded like him. You did it in um, Really? I, all right. So I wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for you. There's no, there's no scenario where my life takes a turn where I'm doing mm -hmm. a podcast. If in 2010, I think, maybe eight, I forget, uh, somehow I got on your show 
And then I, I know not somehow I called your show, talked to you. Then your producer called me and said, come on on Friday. And I did. Um, and that changed my life and my career. Uh, and, and it changed my life in several ways. One, uh, I, I became very close friends with somebody, which is the most important thing. Second, uh, my producer. It, second, it led me to a career of not just writing for law reviews and led me to a and writing led me to a career of radio and TV and and writing for Slate and New Republic and so on. A much more fun life than writing for law reviews by a thousand percent. I owe that to you. I do. And I when I was I do shut up I do. And when I was thinking about doing this podcast because like there's a million podcasts. Why does anybody want to hear Siegel? This is stupid. My wife kept telling me to do it. You kept telling me to do it. And I kept saying, I, don't, I, I have no idea how to do this. And I still don't. But the idea that we can do this for an hour and talk as if there's no cameras on us, which I think we did to a great degree, um, makes me think you taught me something over the last 10 years. And I really appreciate that. Appreciate that. Well, and, I mean, uh, everything you say about me, you're saying about yourself, our relationship has been mutually beneficial. You've been uh, a mentor and a friend and a person I've turned to in the, in, in the hardest times over the time that we've known each other, a person I've uh, grown to trust, but also like someone who's uh, a solid, great guest on my show every time. So you, you've you helped me by being a great guest and even more obviously by being a, a great friend and mentor. And it's completely mutually you know, beneficial, which is the, 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 the I think the best type of a friendship and relationship where both people really get a lot out of it in, in, uh, in, in several ways. And that's not most relationships, but I think it's certainly been ours. And I also, <clears throat> I've been meaning to say, your long hair looks so good, <laughs> like really good. I've always made fun of everything I could about you, ever given a chance. But I am here to say, I really like what is going on a lot. I think it changes. <laughs> I think it changes you in a way that you know. I think you get it. I think you feel. Wait. So this is what happened three days ago. And my mm -hmm. wife may kill me for this, but it won't be the first time. So three days ago, I, I'm lying there with her and saying, I, I have to get a haircut. I'm going to kill myself. I can't stand this. I can't stand the way it looks. I can't stand the way it feels. I, I, this is the longest my hair has ever been. And I was a hippie at one point, but my hair is longer now. And she turned to me and she said two things, more or less. She said, didn't Pete say he loved your hair? a few weeks ago and I and I said yeah and she said and she said well I've been thinking about it and I like it too I don't want you to cut it I said I might I might touch it up a little but I don't want you I said I'm 62 it's, years old I can't have great. this it's terrible it's great the way it comes out the way it's peeking out behind your ears the way I bet you I bet you when you're in the pool when you come up uh, and you come out of the water and it all goes back but you look like uh like a you know Christy Brinkley for P <laughs> Billy Joel's ex-wife we, we, we can't end on a better note than Billy Joel's ex-wife thank you my friend this has been awesome thank I really you. appreciate it <laughs>